You've been given another chance to magnify His holy name. Started up together with one voice we raise. Started up and given praise. Can I get more of the music right here? Start it up, lift up your hands, lift up your voice, let your worship fill this place. Start it up and don't hold back, abandon all the time is now, increase the praise. We've been given another chance to magnify His holy name. Start it up together with one voice we raise. Start it up and give Him praise. My heart, my mind, my soul, my everything belongs to you, my heart. My soul, my everything belongs to you, my heart, my mind, my soul, it belongs to you, yeah, you're worthy of the glory, yes, Lord, you're worthy of praise, yeah, you're worthy of the glory, we're gonna praise you, we're gonna praise you, yes, you're worthy of the glory, yes, Lord, you're worthy of praise, yes, Oh, we're gonna praise. praise we're gonna him. praise him to glory. glory. You're worthy of all the honor, and we sing glory. glory. To glory and honor to you alone, sing worthy. Worthy, oh, worthy Lord, glory. glory. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's just no other place we'd rather be. Start it up, start it up, start it up, lift up your hands, lift up your voice, let your worship fill this place. Start it up and don't hold back, abandon all the time is now, increase the praise. We've been given another chance to magnify His holy name, and we're here to start it up. Oh, we praise, start it up and give Him praise. You're worthy of the glory, yes, Lord. so many times because you get tired while you're singing it and you got to go start it up again come on start it up start it up and give him praise amen go ahead with that next track or i'll talk and, I, and I, i'll talk later yes i've sang this here before but it really is my heart that god would be everything to me going where he wants me to go right dream. 
everything to me. second home to me almost and it's always sweet to me the first time I went to Japan was when I came here to speak like right before I left like you were I was reaching out going oh I need to go sing and tell some people about what I'm what God's called me to do here and I don't know if anybody have me (laughs) But Pastor Battle so graciously invited me, and he, I showed up. He goes, I don't think I've heard you sing since you're about 18, but come on, you were good then. So we'll, we'll, we, we'll figure that. We'll figure we have you. So, And he did that also based on, of course, the lovely, um, oh, goodness, of knowing my parents and, and, and the goodness of my parents who are uh, with me today. I'm so blessed. I said I picked up some visitors along the way with me today, so I'm happy to have Pastor and Mrs. Lloyd Maddox with me today, my parents. Just so you know, when they asked me, when I've when they said they would come with me, I said, well, Daddy, do you want to preach? And I'll just sing. And my mother said, no, we want to hear you preach. So that's why. If you're wondering why he's not preaching today, it's because my mama said no. Uh, but indeed, I am here. I'm, I am 10 days prior to an international mission. 
and it will include Japan, but I'm actually headed to Hong Kong first, and then I'll be headed on to Japan. And, and the purpose of the Hong Kong portion is actually something that I, I told you a little bit about the last time I was here for missions conference, which was October of 2015. Sadly, I was in Japan when you had your missions conference in 2016. But um, one of the partners of, of the ministry, um, a young man that I went to into a hyper-closed country with um, in 2014, he's based out of Hong Kong doing uh, missions work. But right now, we refer to him as a lovely pro-life leader because he is leading the first truly pro-life movement in Hong Kong, China. This is so exciting. Oh my goodness, it's so exciting. So um, I prayed and really, really wanted to go last year because he was launching the 40 Days for Life campaign last year. Y'all, my fancy necklace is getting all twisted up. Um, but he, he was launching it last year. I really wanted to go and was praying about it. And the Lord said, he needs your money more than he needs your smiling face. So we, we sent some financial support to help him. But this year, I really felt like um, he needed... He needed that encouragement from some folks here stateside to show up and say, God bless you. We're excited about what you're doing, supporting him and being there. So I'm uh, another uh, ministry partner of mine from Nashville, Tennessee, is going to be going with me to Hong Kong. And we will be there for the final three days of the 40 Days for Life campaign in Hong Kong. And we'll be a part of the March for Life, which is four hours across Hong Kong Island. Um, and we'll be walking there for the pre-born, that they are truly alive life and getting that message out in Hong Kong. And I'll be taking some support, some supplies and such. I was telling Brandon about that, packing some suitcases for him, filled with some supplies and just some stuff that Americans like when they're living overseas. You know, there's something about cereal and peanut butter that you can't live without and you don't know you can't live without it until you go somewhere that doesn't have it. So be in Hong Kong for five days and then I'm headed back to Japan again and I know so many of you I'm connected Miss Shirley I talk to her all the time on Facebook but so many of you I'm connected to and, and so you know and you see this but the Lord really has an ongoing mission for me personally and in my heart to the people of Japan and so I do believe that this will continue and I, this this trip was actually not planned by me or Pastor Yasu, who is hosting me there. It was, it was planned by the Holy Ghost. It was a bit of a surprise that, that's come upon us, but we're actually working on a more long-term mission for me to do next year. Um, Vanessa's plan is to be there for about a month, but we'll see what the Lord has. Um, there's, there's some things kind of out there in the atmosphere, if you know what I mean, that I know God is working on. So I hope to be telling you a whole lot more um, information about missions to Japan in the coming months and year. But please continue to pray for them just to remind you less than 1% of the population in Japan are Christian. And it is, of course, number two economy in the world. We're not talking about third world country. We're not talking about the back bush where people can't get to them. There's a whole country of Japanese people waiting to hear the gospel and they need someone to tell them. It's that simple. This is not complicated. There's no reason. Um, there's no one, no threat of life. If you go to Japan and tell them about Jesus, you can do it. No, people haven't. I mean, there's work going on, but did I tell you? Less than 1% of a huge population, and they've never even heard the gospel. This is not just people that don't follow Jesus because they chose not to. They haven't heard. They don't know. So I've said, yes, I will go. And thankfully, they are compelled and love gospel music. And one of, like the first song I sang um, started up, boy, they just love that song. And they like to say, they like to sing it in English and try to say the words really fast. And I, I love it. But you know, the presence of God shows up when you lift them up. So I'm going to sing another song. This is a a simple chorus that we all know that we've sang here forever, but did learn it in Japanese. It's something I sing every time I go, and it's so precious to see um, the tears flow and just the presence of God show up in a room where people find out that the Lord loves them, that expression of love, um, that we can say, I love you, Lord, and then it touches them to hear it in their language, um, that we love the Lord. Amen.
snatched me up and said, I see, I see you're coming. Please come sing and preach today. Um, I, had, I was headed in my car to run some errands, and I was in the car, and I was like, Lord, what do you want me to speak on? And God had just laid something on my heart even the past month from a sermon I heard at my home church, and um, immediately it was like, well, share what I've been stirring up in you these past several weeks. And so immediately I was like, okay, I get to preach on mercy. I, I heard, I've heard this sermon before. I'm just letting you know up front. <laughs> My pastor, Lyndall Cooley, preached it. Um, but I'll tell you, even that day, he stood up and said, he goes, I feel like this is less of a sermon, but I'm just, I just want to lay some scriptures out there for you and show you something that's a revelation. And a revelation is, it's, it's not something new. Revelation is something that it's, that's existed, but is newly, freshly re uncovered for you. So this is not new information. It's been sitting in the Bible the whole time. It's been there forever and ever since it was written, but sometimes the Holy Spirit will come in and just shine a light on something in a way that you just hadn't looked at it before, and you went, oh, that's been there all along, and I didn't see that. And God, you've been having me do this, but I didn't know why I was doing this. So today, I, I want to share this with you because it's very simple. This is not something complicated, and I turned in the scriptures, so they're all going to be up here for you to see. Um, but I just want to share it with you because it was simple and revelation and powerful and life-changing for me, truly. I'll tell you, it's changed my prayers, my daily prayers, um, since hearing it. It is about mercy and, and how we pray for mercy and proclaim God's mercy and what that really, really means in our life. So 
I'm just going to dive right into this because, um, like I said, we're working on getting out of here by two. And uh, <laughs> I got 11 pages. If I spent two minutes a page, that would be 22 minutes. So we're going to say I'm going to read fast. Um, but mercy defined is compassion or forbearance. Um, mercy being lenient or compassionate treatment. A blessing that is an act of divine favor or compassion. This is mercy. Everybody's pretty familiar with mercy. Lots of people get mercy and grace sort of mixed up. Nonetheless, this is the de definition of mercy. It's a part of God's divine nature is that he is mercy. The action of that being he is merciful. He is full of mercy, but he is mercy. He doesn't just have it, he is it. It's the foundation of the covenant that God made to us in the Old Testament, that he's holy, he loves us. There's nothing in our flesh, there's nothing about Vanessa that's especially, so special that I would deserve mercy. It's that God loves us, that God loves Vanessa, and because he loves Vanessa, he showed mercy so that I could be reconciled back to him. Because Vanessa on my own, I try to dress up cute. I stay clean. I put my makeup on. There ain't, there's nothing particularly great about me that's going to make God love me. I mess up. I do bad things. I, I am innately sinful. But the mercy of God steps in and because of God's love for us and reconciles us back to him. We, on our own, we have the capacity to show mercy, but it's not especially part of our nature. And, you know, there's a lot of examples that I could give. And this morning I was laying in bed. I was like, what's a good example for this right now? I don't know. I went back to my childhood. Maybe it's because I was staying with my parents last night. But I was thinking, yeah, you know, on our own, we are not necessarily merciful because think about it. When you do something wrong, you want mercy, right? I mean, when the cop stops you, you want him to give you the warning and not the ticket, right? You want, we want the mercy. But when you're driving down the road and the person passes you and you know they're going 110, that thought goes through, I hope that cop stops them because they're, they're about ran up. Yeah. See, we don't, our, na our nature is not to think mercy. And I was thinking as a kid, my, I'm the baby of the family, and my brothers and sisters, they were downright mean to me. They were, weren't they? They were just mean. No. Um, and I was just thinking, I was like, you know, when, I was, when my parents sent me in their room to go think about it because they were going to be in, and I knew that there would be some punishment to come while I was thinking about that, I was thinking of, Lord, please let them, let them just have mercy this time, you know, that they wouldn't, that belt wouldn't come off, you know. But when my brother or my sister had gotten sent to the room for me, I was like, I hope he hits them extra hard this time, you know. He better not get away with it this time, because if my brother came out and he had gotten away with it, he had a dance that went with that, because he had, you know. But on our own, just who we are as human nature, we have the capacity to show mercy, but it's not... That's not natural to us, but it is God's nature to be merciful. He, by definition, is that he's, he gives us a lenient treatment to someone who does not deserve it. My brother did not deserve mercy, though my parents were nice and they were merciful at times. Um, but God shows his mercy to us in his lenient treatment. In the Old Testament, God showed mercy. He delivered his people from slavery. They were terrible. There's times I read through Exodus, and I'm like, oh, God, how did you even keep them alive? I mean, there were times the ground opened up and swallowed a few of them, but, you know, I was like, oh, Lord, why would they? They would say they were going to follow you, and then they wouldn't, and then they go out and, you know, worship other idols, and then he'd turn around, and he'd take them back in. God showed mercy even after they had um, worshipped idols like Baal and Moloch. They turned their backs on God, but when they were enslaved in hard labor, labor in Egypt, God showed mercy, and he delivered his people. He's merciful. In the New Testament, he chose to save the, his people so that we could have relationship with him. He loves us so much. He wants that relationship so that his expression of mercy towards us happened when he sent Jesus so that we could be reconciled to him. Each redemptive act of God is him showing mercy. So I want to, I'm going to start into a, 
part of this where I'm going to read a lot of scriptures and I'm headed to a point. So please hang with me. I'm going to try to stay focused on these scriptures, but there's a point we're headed to and you're going to go, oh. okay, I promise. We're going to get to a point where you're going to go, oh, this, we're getting there. So we're going to start in Psalm 136 and you're going to want to kind of answer to this in a minute because you'll see a pattern here. 136, one, oh, give thanks to the Lord for he is good for his mercy endures forever. Oh, give thanks to the God of gods for his mercy endures forever. Oh, give thanks to the Lord of lords for his mercy endures forever. To him who alone does great wonders for his mercy endures forever. We're going to skip down to verse 10. To him who struck Egypt in their firstborn for his mercy endures forever and brought out Israel from among them for his mercy endures forever. With a strong hand and an outstretched arm, for his mercy endures forever. Can you see here? David starts out, he's proclaiming the goodness of God, and he's saying about mercy. Then he starts talking about what God did that was merciful, and he's reminded, because his mercy endures forever. And then down in verse 23, who remembered us in our lowly state, for his mercy endures forever, and rescued us from our enemies for his mercy endures forever. Who gives food to all flesh, for his mercy endures forever. Oh, give thanks to the Lord of heaven, for his mercy endures forever. And do you see a pattern there? This is just one chapter of 150 of them that David wrote, and he is proclaiming the mercy of God. It's all throughout the Psalms. It's all throughout the Word. Every single one of them, for his mercy endures forever. Now we're going to go over to Second Chronicles, Second Chronicles, pardon me, twenty. And this is something I've preached from this story he, here before, um, and it is one of my favorites. But there is a little twist to this that I hadn't noticed before. So we're going to we're going to go through this again. Um, King Jehoshaphat he had received a message that the people of Israel, they were surrounded by enemies. And the message was, they're coming from here, they're coming from there, they're coming from here, and they're going to be here soon. And the king feared. But then the king called all the people together. He said, let's come together. It's time to fast and pray. Because he knew there was no way they could defend themselves. So this is where we pick up in verse 14. I'm going to read kind of fast here, and I'll schmooze through some of these names that are real fun. When the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jehaziel, the son of Zechariah, the son of Benaiah, and the son of Jael, the son Mataniah, a Levite of the sons of Asaph, in the midst of the assembly, as he said, Listen, all of you Judah and you inhabitants of Jerusalem. This is in response to them fasting and praying. And, and King Jehoshaphat, Thus says the Lord to you, Do not be afraid nor dismayed. Because of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours, but God's. I love that. Tomorrow, go down against them. They'll surely come up by the ascent of Ziz, and you will find them at the brook before the wilderness of Jerusalem. You will not need to fight this battle. Position yourself, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord who is with you. O Judah and Jerusalem, do not fear or be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them, for the Lord is with you. Oh, I love that. The Lord is with you. And Jehoshaphat bowed his head and his face to the ground. And all of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem bowed before the Lord. They worshiped the Lord. I'm going to move forward a little bit here. It says the Levites got up. That's when they began to stand and praise the Lord. The Levites were the musicians. They were the ones who were the worshipers. They they began to sing and praise the Lord with voices loud and high. So they rose up the next morning, went out to the wilderness, and when they went out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear, O Judah, inhabitants of Jerusalem, believe in the Lord your God, and you will be established. Believe his prophets, and you will prosper. And when he had consulted with the people, he appointed those who should sing to the Lord. Now, I read this once before to you all last time I preached. I read it from the message version because I love it. I'm going to read this again. This is, this is New King Jersey. He said he consulted with the people, meaning he went out and he kind of talked to them. He was getting everybody organized. And he appointed those who would sing to the Lord and those who would pra praise the beauty. Um, the message version says, and he put them in choir robes. See, it was like he was organizing <laughs> these worshipers. And instead of putting 
armor on them for the warriors going out. He didn't do that. He wasn't putting coats of armor on them. He was like, all right, we're going to go out singing and praising the Lord. So everybody get your choir robes on and come up here to the front. You're going to come out to the front. And I'll pick back up, he said, because those who should praise the beauty of holiness, as they went out before the army, they were saying, praise the Lord for his mercy endures forever. This is... Okay, this is important. This is what they were saying in those choir robes, organized as the praisers, the Levites, the praisers and the worshipers. Praise the Lord for his mercy endures forever. They're going out. They are certain they are meeting the enemy, right? So verse 22, now when they began to sing and praise the Lord, that's when the Lord set ambushes against all those people that were coming against them, who had come against Judah And they were defeated. For the people of Ammon and Moab stood up against the inhabitants of Mount Seir. Basically, they all turned on each other, utterly killing and destroying each other. And when they'd made an end of the inhabitants of all this, they'd helped to destroy another. So then Judah came to the place. So then the choir showed up at the top of the hill, shouting the mercy of God. So when the choir showed up, shouting the mercy of God, he came to a place overlooking the wilderness. They looked towards the multitude, and there were their dead bodies fallen on the earth. No one had escaped. Okay, I've preached this many times. But what I did not see before, and this is the thing I'm telling you when I heard this sermon that I'm preaching to you today, it just came all over me. It, was, it wasn't just that they were singing and praising, it's what they were saying. See, it was they were proclaiming the mercy of God. They were calling out. See, they were helpless. They did not have the strength to defeat the enemy. They were indeed surrounded. But they went out saying, God, we don't, see, remember mercy, we don't deserve it. But God shows it to us anyway. They went out saying, God, we don't deserve this. We don't have the ability on our own. But, oh, praise the Lord for his mercy endures forever. We're going out and God, somehow, some way, you're going to do this. Thank you for your mercy towards us. Oh, praise God. All right, more scriptures. Because I'm going to show you, that's 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 one of my favorite Old Testament stories. But let's go to the New Testament. And I'm going to cruise through some of these, y'all. From Mark chapter 10, verse 46, where Jesus healed blind Bartimaeus. Bartimaeus, You've heard the story. Now they came to Jericho. As he went out of Jericho with his disciples in a great multitude, blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the road begging. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David. Heal me. Have mercy on me. Have mercy on me. And they warned him to be quiet, but he cried out all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. So Jesus, see, that's what Jesus heard. The person asking for mercy. He didn't hear, Jesus, I'm blind and I can't see. Jesus, hey, have mercy on me. So when Jesus stood still, he commanded them to be called. And when they called the blind man, saying to him, Be of good cheer. Rise, he's calling you. He heard you. Throwing aside his garment, he rose and came to Jesus. So Jesus answered him and said, What do you want me to do for you? Because he didn't tell him at first. What caught Jesus' attention, it wasn't that he told him what was wrong. It was that call for mercy. The blind man said, Rabboni, that I may receive my sight. And Jesus said, Go your way. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus on the road. Matthew 20, 30 through 33, it's the two blind men received their sight. Verse 29, I'll start early. Obviously, I said 30 through 32, but I'm starting early. Now as they went to Jericho, a great multitude followed him. And behold, two blind men sitting on the road. And when they heard that Jesus was passing by, what did they say? Have mercy on us, O Lord, son of David. And then the multitude warned them that they should be quiet, but they cried out all the more, saying, Have mercy on us, O Lord, son of David. 
So Jesus stood still. He called them and he said, what do you want me to do for you? And they said, Lord, that our eyes may be open. So Jesus had compassion and he touched their eyes. And immediately their eyes received sight and they followed him. Let's go on Matthew 15, 22 through 28. And behold, a woman of Canaan came from that region, cried out to him saying, have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely demon possessed. But he answered her not a word, and his disciples came and urged him, saying, Just send her away. She cries out after us. But he answered and said, I was, not, I was not sent except to those lost sheep of the house of Israel. But then she came up closer and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. But he answered again and said, Is it not good to take the children's bread and throw it to little dogs? And she said, Yes, Lord. Yet even the little dogs eat. The crumbs which fall from their master's table. See, she's still going, okay, I get it. I don't deserve it, but I'm asking for your mercy. And he answered and said, oh, woman, great is your faith. Let it be unto you as you desire. And her daughter was healed from that very hour. I'm going to point this out. I mean, my message is about mercy. I'm not throwing faith out with the bathwater, okay? Okay. I'm not throwing faith out. You notice the faith was required. He mentions the faith, every one of these scriptures, and their faith, because of your faith. But what I'm pointing out to you was it was because of the cry for mercy. That's what caught his ear. That's what turned him was the cry for mercy. And then because of their faith, they were healed. They believed, oh, great is your faith. Uh, Matthew 17, 14 through 18. And when they come to the multitude, a man came to him, kneeling down to him, saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he's an epileptic and suffers severely. For he often falls into the fire and into the water. So I brought him to your disciples, but they couldn't cure him. And Jesus said, O oh, faithless and perverse generation, how long will I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him here to me. And Jesus rebuked the demon, and it came out of him, and the child was cured from that very hour. Next scripture, Luke 17, 12. Y'all, as I've read through these notes, even over the past week or so, every time just reading these scriptures, it builds your faith. This is building of your faith, reading these scriptures, going, okay, yeah. Oh, that's right. He did that. Oh, I've heard that story. Yep. He did it there too. That's what I'm, I'm doing here for you is I'm giving you this foundation. So this is your story. This is not just a story from the Bible. This is your story. This is your life. This word, these words, these stories, these are teaching you how to cry out for mercy and then this is your story. Luke 17, 12. Then as he entered a certain village, there he met 10 men who were lepers. Now, lepers, y'all, this is not just flesh falling off. About Lepers, it ate the flesh. It ate the, the bones. There were just nubs in places. I mean, I used to just think, oh, well, then, you know, kind of skin grew back. We've all seen skin grow back. I can't tell you that I've seen a whole lot of, you know, legs grow out from the kneecap down because it had rotted off or fingers or noses. Ten of them, ten of them came. We stood afar off and they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, master, have mercy on us. So when he saw him, he said to them, go show yourself to the priest. And so it was that they went and they were cleansed. All ten of them cleansed and healed. Luke 1, and this is one I hadn't really even noticed, but this is from Song of Mary, the mother of Jesus. She said, my soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior, for he has regarded the lowly state of his maidservant. For behold, henceforth all generations will call me blessed, for he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name, and his mercy is is on those who fear him from generation to generation. Even the mother of Jesus was proclaiming this mercy was going to be from generation to generation. She was birthing the the generations of mercy. 
Something in Jesus, and I've, I've been saying this, something in him cannot resist the cry for mercy. Those of you who are mothers, you know your child could be outside playing by the street. But when they cry out for it's like you could have had the music going, all kinds of things. But some, you, I think I heard something. I think I heard. Is that my child? There's something ab- about Jesus that when we cry out for mercy, he, you saw it in the scriptures before. He, it says, and he stopped and he turned. Because he heard something. It was mercy. The cry of mercy. Have This is just a question. Have we possibly been aiming at maybe the wrong target? That we're praying so earnestly and diligently for things and we've not cried out for the mercy of God. We've stood in faith and this is good. But have we gotten to the end of ourselves, the end of our own ability to do it on our own, and gotten to that place where we said, Lord, have mercy. And this is, I'm I'm making the final connection here for you. That the mercy of God and the presence of God are interconnected. I'm going to remind you, taking you back to the Old Testament, the Ark of the Covenant, the Holy of Holies. Yes, the mercy seat. The Old Testament priests would go into the Holy of Holies. Once a year, they would do this. They'd sacrifice the lamb. And they would take the blood of the lamb and sprinkle it on the mercy seat. And this is where the presence of God manifested in this holy of holies those sacrifices at the mercy seat this connection between mercy and the presence of god i'm going to read from second chronicles 5:13 and there's some about this you can look up in leviticus i think i put the scripture reference on in your notes on the back of the bulletin if you want to kind of read a little bit more about this but um When they were dedicating Solomon's temple, this is what we're going to read about. And it came to pass when the priests came out of the most holy place, for all the priests who were present had sanctified themselves without keeping to their divisions. And the Levites, who were the singers, the worshipers, and all those of Asaph and Heman and Jeduthun, with their sons and their brethren, stood at the east end of the altar, clothed in white linen, having cymbals and stringed instruments and harps, And with them, 120 priests sounding with trumpets. Y'all, this was was not going to be a quiet occasion. Indeed, it came to pass that when the trumpeters and the singers were as one to make one sound to be heard in praising and thanking the Lord, when they lifted up their voice with the trumpets and cymbals and instruments of music and praised the Lord, saying, this is what they said. For he is good, and his mercy endures forever. Amen. That when they did a, that, that the house, the house of the Lord, was then filled with a cloud, so that the priest could not continue ministering because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord filled the house of God. The glory, mercy... And his presence are connected. This is it. This is the thing. Yes, they were lifting up their voice loud. And they were in one accord. These things are important. You've heard these sermons. But it's what they were saying when they were loud and in one accord. They were saying the things that get the attention of God. They cried out. For he is good and his mercy, his mercy endures forever. And when they cried out for his mercy, the cloud filled so that they couldn't stand. The glory of God was in that place. This morning, Brandon was saying, boy, we're in for it. Oh, this service is good. You know what we were doing? Praying for people this morning.
We were crying out for the mercy of God. God save my daughter. God heal my eye. Heal my eye today. Have mercy on me, Jesus. Heal my marriage. Heal my finances. Have mercy on my finances, God. Have mercy on my family. Have mercy on me, God. That it's not just the unity of the sound that's important. But it's our cry for mercy in our nation, in our nation, for our president, for our representatives, for the people that are crying out in anger, for the people that are hurting, for the, those that are trying to even help us and defend us. God, have mercy. God, have mercy on the United States. Let us be a blessing to every other country in the world. Let us be a light. Let us be this banner over us. Let the banner over us be love. God, have mercy on us in the middle of cancer. Oh, God, have mercy in the middle of our trouble where we've stood in faith. Oh, we've stood in faith. Oh, when we've done all you can do, you stand, right? Is it time for us to move from standing and get on our faces and cry for mercy? Mercy and get us attention. We got to get us attention, Lord. Have mercy on us. Have mercy on us, God. Have mercy. Heal our land. Have mercy. Heal my family. God, have mercy on my family, Lord, from generation to generation. Have mercy on my family from generation to generation. Let them all serve you and follow you and be leaders sharing the gospel. Have mercy, God. Not, not one be lost. God, don't let one be lost. Have mercy. Have mercy, God. I've shared the word with you today. And it's this cry for mercy and the connection. The connection to God's presence. It just got me. It just got me. And I haven't been the same. I sat where you're sitting about a month ago. When my pastor just read these scriptures, making the connection, and I sat in a seat just like you did, going, oh, God. Okay, God, you know what? The Holy Spirit has had me praying for mercy, and I didn't even know why. This is not that we haven't prayed for mercy before, but there's something you not you you are going to walk through these doors and leave today, and you're responsible for the information that I have just shared with you today. I'm sealing on it, sealing you today, by Jesus' name and the power of the Holy Spirit, that you can leave here today. And if you don't think God is here in your prayers, check yourself, and you see if you've cried out for mercy yet. Have you called on the mercy of God? Have you called out loud above the crowd? So loud that the busy streets of Jerusalem, your cry, Oh, son of David, have mercy on me! Where Jesus would stop in his tracks and stop in his walk and go, Someone just cried for mercy. Where are they? Where is that cry? That is, we've, we've prayed already, and Pastor, I am ready to give this back to you, whoever you want to take it. Pastor Tom, pray for his mercy. Mercy, mercy, mercy. He is merciful. Amen. Praise the Lord. We've been blessed.